Okay, hey everybody, we're back. Yay, we have meetings again. I know you're all excited. I am, I missed you. Very. Uh, <laughs> I did enjoy the break, I won't, I won't lie. I'm, I, I do like breaks, so I'm, I'm happy to be back, but I did like the break. Um, let me share my screen here. Maybe, there we go, okay. Here are the meeting minutes again in the chat if you um, want them. They're right here. And just as a reminder, this is under the chaos code of conduct. So keep that in mind. Um, your participation here uh, basically means that you have read that and that you agree to it. So if you have not done either of those things, uh, you should do so. So yeah. And again, we don't care if your cameras are on or off whatever you want to do is great. Um, as long as you're happy, we're happy. And I have a dog who's trying to get my attention here. Sorry. <laughs> She's a little distracting. Yeah. I'm, I'm puppy sitting yet again. So um, yeah, you may see her pop her head up here <laughs> in a minute. Cause she, you know, I'm talking. So she thinks I'm talking to her, but I'm not. I'm talking to you all. So anyway, uh, yes, welcome back. Meetings are happening regularly again. Feel free to check the chaos calendar if you've not done so in a while. And see if there's meetings that you are interested in participating in. Because uh, we do have some new ones, maybe, since the last time you looked. So check that out. Um, next thing on the list, I'm looking for Dawn and I do not see her here today. So um, yeah, this is ready for feedback. However, this is Dawn's work. Um, as you may know, we have provided these practitioner guides. Um, this is the fourth one, I think, aside from the introduction. So uh, yeah, she's looking for feedback and you can do that here. After you give it a read, feel free to drop your comments in here, um, whatever, whatever is easiest for you. I just joined, sorry about oh, that. Yay, hi Don. feel free to, sorry to put you right on the spot as soon as you join the meeting. <laughs> No, that's, that's fine. I think the thing to keep in mind, um, and it's in the kind of in the comments um, towards the top, is that these are not comprehensive guides. We're not trying to teach people everything about security. We're trying to give them here are like a couple of things to start with, and here are a whole bunch more links to go off and and learn more after you do these these couple of of things that you can start with. So keep that in mind as you're providing feedback. And Donna, is there a, um, a date by which you're looking to receive comments in a date of publishing in mind, for instance? Uh, yes, I, I would like to have it published on the website before OSS EU so that I can talk about it. And Callie and I have a joint talk about um, some data stuff. So I definitely want to talk about it there. Yeah. So I would say that that is... I would say I would like to have all of the feedback by the 6th of September. Okay. And we'll even bold this so people don't forget. You wanna drop that in the, up here somewhere too? I don't know. Oh, yeah, I can. Okay. Sure. Just in case somebody comes to this and they didn't see that that date. Yeah, in this. totally. Questions for Don? Who has I was actually wondering, so if this is the fourth or fifth practitioner guide that's published, and we have them on the website, I think right now it's just a drop down list. Have you thought about if you start making a bunch more? Like what that would look like? That. Um Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I'm I'm hoping to keep this relatively simple and not have a bunch more. Maybe maybe eight to 10 guides. Okay. 
Although I do think, you know, we've talked about having other types of guides, like, you know, case studies, and there's, there's lots of other stuff we could do. So at some point, it might make sense to break them down into multiple, multiple pages or something. But I think right now, I think right now we're okay. Okay. It's a good question. Maybe in the future, we need like a resources or something like that on the site. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, we just have, we have so much documentation that people use, whether it's through the models or the metrics or now the guides. We've always, and I know that we, we did a big redesign with the knowledge base, just something to, I think, maybe always keep on our mind. Yeah, especially as it, it grows, you know, we may need to adjust and shift with with the more stuff that's I was also thinking too about the um, education resources, you know, like that's another whole portal whole thing. So yeah, just keeping everything kind of together and organized and, and yep. searchable and discoverable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, any other questions for Don before we move on? All right, then let's go ahead. Salva, are you okay to go ahead and start your your chit chat presentation? Yes. Awesome. I will turn it over to you. Thank you. May I share my screen? Yeah. Indeed, you may. Let me. Uh, I think I have to stop sharing, which I'm happy to do. There we go. Go for it. It's all you. So I can make this work. All right. So I hope you guys see the same thing as you just did from a moment ago. We see the minutes. Yeah, I oh, still so, see the minutes. Okay, there. So, so, yeah, so this is uh, my copy of it. So, uh, so I'm here on behalf of uh, a, a small group in the Cyclone DX community. Um, so Cyclone DX is a uh, one of two standards that are used as a software bill of materials, which basically is uh, um, a, a standardized way of sharing meta metadata uh, uh, about uh, projects or components or software uh, between uh, providers or, or suppliers or software uh, development communities or projects and their users, uh, and strictly speaking, also anyone in between these two parties. Um, one of those is uh, organized by the, the OWASP community, which is very much about the security online and uh, uh, open source um, guides, no, guides on how to write good uh, software. Uh, but they also care about the metadata stuff. And, uh, on Thursday this week, the day after tomorrow, um, we'll be starting a new working group, uh, which will, the goal is to try to introduce open source project sustainability metadata into the standards. And the purpose with this is to uh, um, help the projects out there, the open source maintainers and volunteers to communicate uh, any needs they may have to their users um, in, a, in a hopefully clear and authoritative way uh, and uh, uh, where the standard provides enough examples that are relevant um, that uh, they can understand what these are for and also so that uh, any users who later reads these do uh, documents when they use an SBOM, for example, to enumerate all their dependencies, which they'll be required by law in the European Union, at least starting um, in, in later this year and going forward in a couple of years. They, I'd love to see them, these users, or, um, um, get some idea of what's going on in the components and the, comp and the projects they depend on. So a while back, I created an issue on the CycleDX specification uh, tracker and said, uh, uh, I read a really nice 
article uh, and uh, suddenly it uh, clicked and I figured out uh, this is something that is solvable. And it turns out the Cyclone DX people agree with me um, to the point where that this has been decided that we'll include this into the version 1.7 that is scheduled for yeah before summer next year uh, uh meaning in april may we'll see what would you actually what, what are you including the list of like one level no. of dependencies or no the dependencies are the to list the dependencies is already a requirement that will come okay. through law and, and it's just like a first layer dependencies is that right that's that's the minimum uh but if okay. uh, from a security perspective, which is the laws are about cybersecurity, it's meaningful to uh, have a, a full dependency tree or, or graph, strictly speaking. Uh, and uh, right now, there's a lot of useful information around who made it and uh, what's the uh, unique idea we to identify it by and how do we contact the, uh, the author of that component and stuff like that but there's nothing in the spec that allows for adding sustainability metadata and that's what we want to add and so is, it about, is it about the the metadata of those those upstream dependencies yes okay so if a project, say, for example, uh, uh, let's assume uh, some random guy that uh, lives in the cellar at his mom's somewhere in Nebraska, uh, uh, he gets a cartoon made uh, of himself at XKCD and then figures out, oh, well, I better go on with my working for free, volunteering work so that this whole uh, stack of uh, uh, boxes don't uh, topple. Uh, and now, the way things work today is that if he needs help, he has to reach out to the users through like the forums or a, 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 an issue tracker, but very few bother reading that stuff. And it's only the, the most invested and competent users that are even often aware that the dependency deep inside their graph uh, needs help. So we're trying to... This, the goal here is to try to help these people, literally. And uh, we could say, what well, you could always fund uh, them. And yes, that's one of the parameters we want to add there. So it's completely clear and unambiguous that funding is welcome. And where do you go to help with, with that? But uh, not all businesses are in a position where they can offer help in that way. It might be uh, something that uh, requires a decision at the budget budgeting meeting or something like that. So the, my hope here is that we also can introduce uh, fields or information on different types of um, um, different types of ways to help uh, 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 that project. Say, for example, if the project uh, maintainer says, I would love to grow a little bit more and uh, create some branding, uh, and meaning a logo or a mascot and perhaps uh, some color schemes or something. But they, he, that person might not be able to uh, do it by themselves. They, this is not their skill set. So they could signal to their users, I need somebody that can assist me with make, creating a branding for my project. And if there is one project, one user among maybe hundreds or thousands of users that has one resource available, somebody with those skills and some free time, they can decide to spend some of that time on helping the project instead of going through the budgeting process. Uh, that kind of option is at the moment not available. And what I am hoping is that this standard and eventually all other sta similar standards like it, where this like SPDX and SWID or, or whatever, can open this door basically. So um, in the ticket which I made for this here, and I'll share the link with you guys uh, in the chat now. I've, I've added a bunch of stuff. This is my picture of um, uh, what an open source ecosystem looks like. I'll add some extra bits here that are related to the European Cyber Resilience Act, which will be is actually an interesting part of this discussion. 
I will not go into that here unless somebody asks. Um, but even with, if the maintainer up here needs something, the the packages are passed along downstream through a language ecosystem like PyPy, and then maybe repackaged on the Debian system, and then sent further, well, downstream to an integrator environment. Somebody, a customer who integrates it into an application and puts it into production. This is the usual thing we can imagine. This is a, the map you see on the screen now is meant to be an, an ideal illustration, a generalized map that can transpose on any combination of ecosystems. And we have to also be aware that um, the, the, the dependency tree there can be super complex. I and mean, no matter how the metadata flows, we have to ensure that the important stuff, the information that is critical around the project is actually communicated. So some of the stuff we want to do in this project is, all, is to figure out uh, what can be done to make it completely clear that sustainability info is just as important as vulnerability info around the package or, or any kind of mitigations. And with this comes also the ideas of what kind of um, state is the project in for example, it's open for adoption. It's as the maintainer wants to hand it off to someone else because they need some. They need to take a break or find something else to do. The project might be done. There's literally nothing left. This was a closed problem. There's nothing more to solve. The algorithm has been implemented. There's no. The, all the bugs have been removed. That's even if a project is completely stable and has no interaction on. Uh, uh, an issue tracker, it might still be completely usable and has no, have no errors and therefore shouldn't get the low rating or, or metrics or whatever. Uh, and all this stuff here uh, is useful to communicate from the upstream author down to end the user. And among this is need funding, they need funding and they need support. And to get support, we should also ask what kind of support is it that is needed? And I've tried to put together a, li a link here, a list of uh, different types of support. This is uh, a, a brain of mine, plus I've taken uh, some, uh, some of the useful ideas uh, that uh, you guys shared, uh, one of you guys shared with me uh, yesterday. Um, so help with outreach and marketing, help with code review, uh, writing documentation, community management, technical infrastructure and hosting, event organizing, or OSPO assistance. Uh, like uh, if a larger community uh, uh, that, ha that has a pop popular project, uh, maybe it's meaningful to have uh, some liaison or uh, contact point for uh, open source program offices. Uh, some have are big enough that they need fundraising uh, and. Uh, uh, how about legal counsel? All these are needs a project might find themselves having that could be solved with some assistance from uh, their users. Um, this list here is not complete. I've added a few from you guys here. User interface experience and accessibility is directly from the list you guys made. So thank you for that. And um, this idea here, we want to put into uh, the Cyclone DX as bomb standard in such a way that it's attractive to use for the developers out there and the maintainers um, so that uh, all the users out there can get uh, meaningful information of all the components hopefully at some point not only whether or not they have bugs or security issues with them but also long-term issues around the project health uh, and uh, if there's anything actionable. Uh, if Sean. any of you guys are interested in this, please tell me. Yeah, Sean has a question. But it's yes. so I have a, I get, it's like any conference, I have a question, but it's veiled as a statement. It's really a, a shield around a statement, which is, um, so in the community, we have, in terms of presenting like across a scope that I think you're talking about, an assessment of project health, I think that's something that we've been reluctant to do. What okay. I do think that chaos metrics can help with, though, 
is to describe the nature of a project. So for example, Remy's team at the um, US Health and Human Services Department uh, has created an algorithm for classifying projects by Nadia Eggball labels. Um, we can also provide information about number of contributors, number of recent contributors, number of new contributors, which I think are all helpful signals that, that don't provide a direct piece of advice that this project is healthier than this project. Because I think we've found in our experience that's super difficult to really reliably say. Um, there's uh, maybe a, some one aspect here which might be uh, I, I don't know how to say it dif different uh, 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 or than what I think is your usual case. But if I understand what you guys, the Kairos community does, you provide an outside-in perspective. Like you stand on the outside and you look at something from the outside and figure out what is going on by gathering different types of metrics. Yeah, um, from, for the most part, that's what we do because exactly. there are way more open source projects than people here to cover them all. <laughs> exactly. So what I'm uh, here asking for is not an outside in perspective. It's an inside out perspective, which I would like to enable. This means uh, okay. these, these fields here are completely voluntary. If the developer, the maintainer set, set, has nothing to say, there will be no fields in the spec. There's nothing required here, but uh, the day they feel down and need help or, or are frustrated with the amount of uh, 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 troublesome users that uh, are shouting at him in the issue tracker, and needs uh, someone to help offload or manage this uh, uh, situation, then he, it's, I think it's useful to have a way for them to signal this that reaches not to the immediate community, but even to those that are um, not directly, but by the fact of using the, uh, the component uh, part of the community, like the silent bystanders. This is literally a, a my a I would like, like to see the open source bystander effect getting addressed because there is a massive uh, bystander effect in operation throughout the open source world right now where everybody looks at what's happening and is waiting for them <coughs> to make, take action. Uh, this uh, way, at least we can try to create some signals that uh, t uh, tell people that if you are in a position to help, then please do so. So I'm trying to think of the the workflow described in the issue that you brought up. There are actually some prescriptive ideas here, like the adopt me, the handoff, the need help, yeah. all these things here. So I think if I'm hearing what your response is, that what you're asking for is some assistance in terms of uh, metrics assessment that the insiders can look at so that then they can decide how and where to put these tags or other requests for help into their project. There, yeah, well, there are two, two, two parts to this. This is the, uh, the, the list I'm showing now is the general state of the project. And from it, it has two uh, parties that can have something meaningful to say about this. The, it's the maintainer themselves that could say that they, for example, would like the project no, no, the, uh, to hand off the project to someone else. That's the maintainer claiming this. Now, if the maintainer somehow becomes unavailable or non-responsive, this is literally like the bus fact, as, as it's yeah, 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 for toast. Uh, they, they, uh, and I, I have friends or, uh, or, 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 and colleagues uh, in the, my community that have said, you know what, I'm done. Uh, I, I need to take care of my mom and all this stuff uh, that uh, I used to work is, I'm just going to let, let it lie. Uh, the p people who discovered this first are the people who organized the ecosystem where uh, the package is being uploaded when it's being published. And users usually um, contact uh, a specific place in our ecosystem. I, I, I work with the CPAN people, and that's a Perl ecosystem. 
where somebody you might contact uh, them and say, hey, I cannot reach this person. Well, what should I do? This uh, There's a bug here that needs to be fixed. It's critical for us. So in a sense, there are two parties that can say something meaningful about the project. It's the ecosystem where it's being published and it's the party themselves. Uh, but uh, even then, uh, it, it, the prescriptiveness about this isn't uh, what you're supposed to do. It's about a need, uh, that need that needs to be fulfilled. It's uh, still somebody who needs to, uh, somebody should hopefully uh, volunteers to do something about that. But but uh, um, prescribing stuff as, uh, or or forcing or creating some imposition is not on the agenda here. So for uh, for each of these, is the intention to allow somebody, whomever that somebody is, to make a declaration in the Cyclone DX? document similar to like making a declaration in say like an SPDX document about a license or about a vulnerability that's been published around this. So it's a declaration. And if there is no declaration to be made, a no assertion could be provided, something along those lines. Um, yep. So the, okay. I mean, that makes sense. So how, um, a lot of what we do with metrics are related to trends and how they change over time. And so for a, a license, it seems like the point in time declaration on a standard like SPDX or Cyclone DX would be okay, that I wouldn't expect the license to change too often. Um, but if we were to have a metric that was somehow say related to within community responsiveness, that's a declaration that could change in in a month or two months pretty rapidly. So if, have you thought about that? Well, um, there are a couple aspects around that. Um, uh, first of all, um, this signal should be considered uh, a way to call for help. Uh, we can, of course, create statistics on how many create Will have a wish for that or something, uh, uh, but it will having it be up to date, but with just looking at the SPOMET file, file itself that you have maybe get provided with the package you install or something like that at some point. That's probably going to be bad data. So, uh, some of the and I meaning uh, not updated data. Um, so it's meaningful to speak of uh, adding a field into this where we, we link to an authority up-to-date version of the SBOM. This is already something that is required uh, uh, in some of the legislation out there. Uh, so we will just be tagging along on, on some existing information. Uh, and then say, for example, uh, if we can have the ecosystems, the language ecosystems, publish SBOMs along the packages, uh, uh, having an SBOM that can be updated independently of the package uh, or uh, along a, a new release uh, would be, be able to help at least people who have an older version of that SBOM to figure out what the current situation is, in a sense, thereby getting an up-to-date state uh, uh, of, of, of what's going on. Um, but uh, the part of the problem, which I think is maybe more important here, is that uh, um, I'm wary of, for me at least, I'm wary of hiding this type of information behind links. Because uh, I know, okay, my impression is that most people out there, they don't uh, care about this kind of information unless it's completely forced up uh, into their face, uh, literally speaking. Um, so but finding the right balance and how to do this is part of the conversation we're hoping to have on this working group. All right, thank you. Eric, you had a question too. <laughs> I, I had a question and then uh, Salva mentioned the the concern with putting information behind links because my thought was as these things can change over time 
um, maybe the S bomb only points towards a source of truth where that information can, can be obtained, hopefully in a standard format. And so as the project situation changes, <clears throat> you don't have to go back and update the SBOM of all the versions, especially if they're packaged together with releases. I don't think anyone is going to go back in to update a release just to update the project status on the SBOM. Yeah, that, that would so, also be a bad idea, actually. Uh, the, right. The whole, a major point with SBOMs is that it describes what you have. Um, uh, and that's the, the, the problem the SBOMs are supposed to solve is, is to help people figure out what is actually running on their system in production and earning money. And uh, to see if it's secure and if it's compliant with license uh, requirements and all that stuff. Uh, now, tagging uh, sustainability information on top of that g makes it a little bit out of sync. But it's still, in my opinion, so important to get this information out there that uh, uh, it might be worth uh, uh, anyway. But uh, uh, this is also part of the discussion we uh, are looking to have in the working group to explore it a little bit because there are some perspectives, say for, uh, for example, around medical devices, where this is also useful. They have software, they need to, it cannot be updated always. If it might be some software running inside a pacemaker. You cannot update that without uh, doing certain things. Um, uh, uh, but there needs to be an, an associated SBOM with that. And if it depends on open source software, you really want to know if your pacemaker has a, a, a dependency graph that is sustainable. Happy to take any other questions if this. I've already yeah, taken half an hour of you guys this time. What are the, what are the next steps for you in the cycle so, of this group? So we're we are literally starting on Thursday this week in about 48 hours and uh, the first few steps there are to create uh, use cases that we think are uh, um, uh, relevant and illustrative um, this will have to be based on hopefully as much as possible on the experiences that we've had uh, so that's why we're reaching out to find people who have experiences around this and on how to how their business or their project or institution has interacted with open source projects or if they're on the other side of the equation what kind of uh, uh, offers they uh, an open source project has gotten or or they felt they needed off to get offers uh, to help uh, I, i've been around in the per community for 25, 30 years. So I've, I've seen that perspective. Um, and there's a lot of stories that has been told over beer over the years. But I'm just one person and we're just a few people with a uh, willing more, and uh, especially uh, different kinds of uh, experiences from different communities. Is this an open meeting? Do you have a it, there is an there is an invitation uh, in the link I can share with you. Though. Okay. Um, so this is the current the project page. Um, it, there's an open meeting invite there. Please join us on the uh, Cyclone DX Slack and say hello before uh, joining. Uh, we want to also have a community that uh, we're happy to work with uh, and get to know each other um, and all of all the good stuff. Um, uh, there is a lot of work to be done here. So, uh, and we will, uh, while some of us involved in this have done this quite a few times already, a bunch of us do this for the first time. So there will be a little bit learning as we go. But if you, uh, so that means if the more you have to learn in order to get up and running, the harder this will be. So that means if you already have familiar to, familiarity with open source ecosystems, supply chains, how they work, 
uh, interaction between open source communities and businesses. Uh, this uh, Cyclone BX standard, uh, the more of this stuff and this body of knowledge you're familiar with, the easier it is to um, uh, contribute. Um, with this said, uh, I do have like the, uh, made a reading list that covers quite a bit of this, and this is not something which is actually related specifically for this project. But uh, let's see. Uh, at the bottom of the comment in the uh, uh, Cyclone DX issue, there's the comment that lists all these uh, states. There's a source that goes to a security web page. This is the Meta CEPA, the CEPA security group, which I, I'm actually a, a part of. In there, we can find a reading list. This has a whole lot of information on how, what SBOMs are, how to use them, relevant papers and articles, which standards that are relevant, and all, all kinds of other stuff. And some super useful stuff around SBOMs that become, are becoming law in the European Union, specifically around, around the Cyber Resilience Act. So this is a, a lot to read. Uh, uh, all of it, or most of it, is relevant in some way. Um, I do not expect everybody to read this. It, it's it's incredibly useful. I've I've put this spent a better part of this year to put together all this all of this. Um, uh, uh, but you are free to browse, find out what is interesting here, and help this to inform you if you are in, uh, keen on getting a deep dive into this topic. This will be informative for the I'm, I'm hoping this will be informative in, in general for the open source communities out there, but also specifically for this uh, project here. All right, well, thanks. I, I'm a, I'll try to join. We have another meeting kind of at that time, but maybe if some of us could be there, that'd be cool. Yeah, I mean, I think I could contribute some to this. Yeah. The meetings are on Thursdays at uh, 1800. Uh, UTC, no, 1600 UTC, uh, every second week, like, okay. uh, so it means uh, on uh, uh, even numbered weeks. So this week, week, we're in week 34 now, so it, and it will be going also 22nd, next meeting on the 5th, and then uh, uh, 19th which will be during the uh, conference in Vienna I won't be I'll be there and not join this meeting um, and then oh, going on forward until we're done so uh, uh, the link the uh, Google Calendar link in this document uh, is an invitation so you feel free to put it in your calendar and join the Slack channel uh, if this is interesting for you guys, uh, well, this help is... us help open source. Yeah, yeah, this is good. Thanks. Yeah, very helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. Does anybody have any final questions for Salva? All right. Thank you. I hope thank you. Very and... much, uh, for you guys. Yeah, this is great. And then I will go back to sharing the minutes. There we go. I, w I dropped some notes in here. So if I got that wrong, feel free to fix it. <laughs> Make it right is what I'm saying. Okay, let's go ahead and move on then. We have about nine minutes left. Uh, Moodle Cloud, who wants to talk about this? I'm not sure who put that in. It was just me. We had signed up for it as part of education. I don't know if this is something we still need. I do not know the answer to that. Okay, uh, we can talk about it next time. Now that now you know the question. <laughs> yeah, I don't see peculiar on here either. Okay. Yeah, there she is. Yep, she's here. Um, yeah, that's certainly something we can talk about. I'll okay. Just... Next time. Um, same thing probably with this community survey. I dropped that in there. Uh, definitely not urgent. We can certainly talk about that next time. Because there are probably other things here that 
or a little more timely. Um, the metrics work to the new template. Do you want to give us an update on that? I just wanted to let you know that I just sent out the email to the finance team about spending some of those dollars on moving to the new template. And it looks like it'll happen. Um, we had kind of circulated this for a while. And I think now is the time to kind of use those funds that we have either in LFX or Open Collective, which is which is ever easiest gay org. <laughs> so one is easier than the other. I know that. <laughs> so I know too. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to also use the LFX ones, but I, sometimes I think it's a little trickier. Um, nonetheless, that's that seems like it's moving forward positively. Awesome. That's really great to hear. That's a yep. huge project. So that'll be fantastic. Um, any questions about that for anybody? Does anybody have questions, comments, anything? Okay. Um, updates on the ISO standard work. I suppose that'd be me. I, I have tried to, there are a few emails that are out to the JDF right now, folks at the JDF, and the response has been a little bit slow, so just kind of in a holding pattern at the moment. So I really do need their help on taking a look at what we had put together as a potential document for a standard. And I just, I really need feedback because I don't really know how to go forward. Yeah, Georg. I had added this on here because on Thursday we have a podcast recording about standardizing the metrics. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted to yeah. ask where we're at right now. I know Sean is also on that podcast so that as we record the podcast, we have the most up to date okay. information. There's going to be so the most up to date information is we're starting with um, two metric models, not metrics themselves as candidates for standardization. One is security. And then give me a second and I'll get you the other one. Um, community activity are the two. And so where we're at with that right now is they're in a, like a sort of format for ISO standardization, but we just need to kind of work through that Officially with the JDF, and once that gets okayed, then we'll go on a bit more of a speaking tour on those two documents to collect feedback. And that tour will probably take six months to a year. Um, and then at that point, I think we start going through the process of trying to get approval, which is kind of another like six months or something. Yeah, this seems like it's going to take forever. <laughs> I mean, That's standards, okay. it, that doesn't surprise me in any way. Yeah. Standards are like that. So just we have a couple that we're just kind of, you know, maybe testing the waters with before we go and move all of these docs into what we think might be standard form. OK, thank you. And then we'll, of course, talk about the motivation and why we think the standards will be good as international standards from an adoption perspective and all the work that has gone into this. So we have plenty to talk about. Okay, cool. Thanks. Any other questions for Matt or whoever about this? The next meeting on this is not until September something. I don't know the date off the top of my head, but it'll be a little while. So. In the meantime, if you want to join this conversation, it usually happens in the metrics models, metrics models group. Yeah. And we started the calls on the Chatham House rule for this. Yep. That's great. Yeah, Perfect. that's an important thing to note for sure. And they happen once a month, not biweekly, the ISO standard meetings in particular. Um, but that is on the cast calendar so go check it out if you're interested in joining that meeting because they will not be recorded okay we have three minutes <laughs> let's go on to uh to scarf georg did you put this on here i 
did. I would like to explore Scarf. I raised that with the governing board and got the okay to uh, broaden it out. Grimoire Lab could be a first candidate. I put together a longer post further down if you scroll down that explains more of what's going on. So we're looking for feedback from the community before we actually go implement anything. Uh, SCARF is a service for collecting download metrics, telemetry data, even on documentation like Google Analytics. And then we can hopefully get a better understanding of how the open source project is being used or how often it's being downloaded. A couple of metrics that we don't have right now in the chaos metrics or even in Grimoire Lab. And I don't think Augur captures that either because it requires a completely different infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I think it's worth it. I mean, telemetry data is extremely useful. Um, you know, you've looked into it. I think it's worth an experiment. Yeah, I mean, it's... And it's privacy preserving. So while they do collect email, the IP address, once it's enriched, they throw it away. So. I think it's okay. And Georg, it's primarily using this tracking pixel. That's how it keeps track of downloads. Is that right? Uh, the scarf gateway number one is how it keeps track of downloads. So whenever someone hits the download link before it goes to the actual download, it goes first to scarf registered that this version was being requested and then it goes and forwards to the actual download. And this can be embedded even in package managers like PyPy, etc. Awesome. Questions for Georg about that? We'll see. I'll just be interested to see the data. Yeah, it feels like that's something people ask about a lot. And so having something <laughs> is better than nothing. So that's good. Um, really quickly, Chaos Sponsors profile is live. Any comments on that, Georg? Just announcement mostly? Big celebration! Took forever. We hey. are now on uh, GitHub uh, sponsor. This was uh, partly because the like Microsoft had a report out on sponsoring open source projects and being part of this larger ecosystem with GitHub where companies can just write one check and then distribute it amongst all the projects that are in GitHub sponsors. Uh, hopefully this will allow us to receive more funds in the future. And I will just reach out to Emma and let her know that that process has been completed because I know she's asking about that. So I'll let her know. Perfect. Thank you Thanks. so much, Georg, for doing that, for doing that, for real. Thank you. Um, and then just, of course, reminders. So take everybody take a quick look at these and remind yourselves of them. So because we're out of time today, so I'm not going to remind you. You're going to have to remind yourselves. Um, thank you, everybody, for showing up. Thank you, Salva, for your um, presentation today. And uh, we really appreciate you being here and giving us that um, all that information. Um, yeah, that's it. Everybody have a great rest of your day. We'll see you here next week. See ya. Bye, everybody. Bye. Yeah, bye.